All right. How many of you have watched the movie Pollyanna? Pollyanna. Okay, first service, everybody here had watched it. Second service, not so many. Third service, you know, the demographic changes, I think, as we go on later in the morning. Not so many have watched it. I'll give you the storyline. Storyline is in Pollyanna. It's a book and a movie. You've got this orphan girl, and she goes to live with her rich, grumpy, unhappy aunt, Aunt Polly. And Aunt Polly, because she's rich, grumpy, and unhappy, has a household of servants, rich, grumpy, and unhappy, and that's actually overflowed into the town. The whole town is grumpy and unhappy. And Pollyanna comes in, and she is an irritant to Aunt Polly because she's always playing this glad game. She's got this effusive joy that just comes out of her. And she's accused of, of operating in unreality, of imagined joy, of imagined happiness that, that really isn't based in fact. And at, at some point, she actually confronts the local preacher in the town and says, you know, my dad actually told me that, that I need to be happy. She says she learned her joy, her happiness from her father, who said that there are more than 800 rejoicing texts in the Bible. And if God took the trouble to tell us over 800 times to be glad and rejoice, he must want us to do it. And he does. And that's what we're going to look at today, this whole matter of joy. We're in the Advent season. Last couple of weeks, we looked at hope and of peace. Today, we're going to focus in on joy. We're going to look at joy as, as a practical thing, like Pollyanna's joy, and as a profound thing that's tied to who we are in God and in the fact that we actually are created by the happiest person in the universe, God. I don't know if you've thought of him that way, but think about it that way. We're looking at the, the idea that we were created for joy. In fact, there were these really smart Bible scholars that got together several hundred years ago, answering some of the basic questions about the Christian faith, and they drew from the entire Bible in gaining their answers. From Genesis to Revelation, they picked questions out and answered the questions. One of the, the most famous questions they asked is, what is the chief end of man? That is, why do you live? Why do you exist? What are we here for? And that's a common question you'll hear from Christians and non-Christians. What's the meaning of life? And the answer they gave, again, from a compilation of all Scripture, was a very succinct one that said, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The chief end for which we were created is glorifying God by enjoying him forever, is the way John Piper says it. The idea is that we glorify God best by the joy that we have in who he is, by the joy that we have in who he has made us to be. Now, we need to dive deep into this because, again, like with Polly and Aunt Polly, you're going to be contagious with the attitude that you carry. It's going to be an attitude that's stinky, that people are going to catch, or it's going to be an attitude that, that carries with it something that actually transforms life. I mean, Christians are supposed to be the happiest people in the world. That's what I've heard. Do you think that's evidence, that, that that's evident from, from what you see most of the time in, in most churches? I mean, I think around here, yeah, it is pretty evident, but it needs to be more so. It needs to be an attitude that we do carry, attitude. Attitude can be defined very simply as an inward disposition that expresses your faith and character. Your attitudes express your faith and character. Now, you can have some wrong faith, some wrong beliefs, and that's going to be expressed in your, your attitudes, or you're going to have biblically-based ones that, that express your faith and, and your character. Joy is supposed to be an attitude that's carried and evident within us. Let's look at the big picture real quickly. Humans were originally created by God, created in the image of God, and they were created to live in joy. Adam and Eve created to live in joy by God. What happened? Satan enters the picture. Satan enters the picture and disrupts the relationship between God and man. And in the disrupting of that relationship by sin, the, the, the intimacy of joining together with God, of walking with God, it says, in the cool of the evening in the garden has been disrupted. Man's cast out of the garden, man and women, man and woman cast out of the garden, and they are separated from God. There's no basis, really, for joy any longer because that, that joy that we've been given by the presence of God is no longer really there. Jesus Christ comes. He enters time and space. And what's the first declaration that's made about who he is and about the good news that he brings? 
Let's take a look at Luke chapter 2, verse 10. It's a, a, a section of scripture that you're familiar with, especially this time of year, but it's one of those sections of scripture, those verses that, that's been said so many times, especially at Christmas, that it becomes like jingle bells. I mean, really, it becomes something that's devoid of the power that it's supposed to carry and the revelation that comes with it. The angel said to the shepherd, to the shepherds in the field, the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I'm bringing you, I bring you good news of great joy, great joy, which will be for all the people. Why was it great joy? Because what's happened? The God who walked in the garden with Adam and Eve was God with them. And what's the word we have from scripture from Isaiah the prophet most commonly about what you call it when God is with you? Emmanuel, exactly, God with you. And so was Emmanuel in the Garden of Eden? I'd say so. He was there walking and talking with Adam and Eve. Now what's happened? Emmanuel has come again. Emmanuel has returned and Emmanuel walks and talks with people for 33 years three in ministry publicly. And then he dies on the cross. He rises from the dead. He ascends into heaven. But his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, God the Spirit, comes back. And what happens now? The Holy Spirit, as you and I place our faith in Jesus Christ, comes to reside in us. We got it way better than Adam and Eve ever had it. Adam and Eve had God walking and talking with them, sometimes in the cool of the evening, it says. We've got Emmanuel, God with us, in us, all the time. Now, do you feel it? No, not most of the time. You don't feel it. If you're like me, at least you don't feel it all the time. But the truth is that he's there. He resides in us. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God in us. And Emmanuel, God in us, means that that we have the DNA of joy residing in us. Think about this matter of God being a creator who epitomizes joy. How how can that be? I mean, he knows all the junk that's going on here on earth. How can he be full of joy? Because first of all, the Bible says he's a God of joy. Let's look at one scripture, Zephaniah 3.17. Where it says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you. God will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Now, think about it. Go out from there. Do a little study yourself this week and looking up more about this joyful God. But just think about it in this way. God's perfect. God is joyful. If God is full of joy, that means God is full of joy. Just like God is love and full of love. Just like God is peace and full of peace. Just like God is eternal and full of eternity. I mean, you go on, anything God is, he's all in. He doesn't do it by halves. And so what we have is a creator that is joyful. And he created us initially to carry that joy, but in a different way, so it was separated by sin. Jesus Christ comes, he lives, he dies, he rises from the dead. And the separation that sin brought between God and man has been removed. We have reunion, a union with Emmanuel again. And now that joy which is external that we could experience is a joy that's internal and truly has become part of the DNA that we carry. We have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us, which includes joy. Let's take a look at 522, Galatians 522. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and it continues on. But the idea is the fruit of the Spirit, a fruit of the Spirit, is joy. It's a part of what comes in. It's a part of what we have and of of who we are supposed to be. Let's define joy. Joy by Webster is defined as a feeling of great pleasure and happiness, an emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune by the prospect of possessing what one desires. I agree with about 85% of that. The important part is that it's a feeling of great pleasure and happiness by the prospect of possessing what one desires. What do we desire? Well, hopefully you can identify you desire intimacy with God that goes on for eternity. And 
And that's what we, we have as we look at joy. And, and this whole idea of it, it, it means great pleasure and happiness, people stumble up on that. We talked about this when we did that series on Beatitudes a while back. We've gotten this idea that happy is a bad word with Christians. That happy based, is based on your circumstances and joy is something that's deep. Joy, it's deep down in your heart. I've got that joy, 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 joy. Where? Down in my soul. Problem is, too many have it down in their soul and it never comes out through their face or the mouth. The idea is that joy is something that is deep, but joy is also something that's supposed to be out there. It's supposed to have both the, the Westminster Confession, Confession of Faith profundity to it and the Pollyanna practicality to it as we're looking out, as we've got a smile on our face that evidences what we really think. Joy and happiness, most of the time in the New Testament, come from the same Greek word. It, when you look at the Beatitudes, we've talked about this, I know, but blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, can just as easily be translated, happy are, happy are, happy are. You, you get to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, and it talks about the blessed God, just as easily the happy God that, that we serve. I mean, it's the idea that, that we need to get past these artificial divisions that have come in where happy is a bad word. I mean, maybe you've heard this before. Christians need to be holy, not happy. God wants our holiness, not our happiness. Baloney. God wants our holiness, and he also wants our happiness. The two are supposed to be inextricably intertwined. They're supposed to be inseparably de dependent on each other. If you're holy, you're going to be happy. If you're happy in the right way, it's because you're holy. The two go together, and they're supposed to go together. And we're not supposed to be ashamed of the fact that we are both holy and happy people. And, and get out of the, the idea that, that it's other than, because I, personally, I think it's a strategy of the enemy to be off-putting so that we can be increasingly off-putting to people as you know, we, we have this, this artificial... Artificial sincerity, is that a right thing to say? How can you be artificially sincere? But, but that's what it seems like. I mean, it's an artificial air that we put on of a holiness that somehow is diminished if we smile when we say holy words. It, it ought to be something that, again, brings both the, the joy and the truth together because joy is truth. And it's supposed to be what we carry, again, handled the right way. Uh, Dallas Willard talked about it this way. Dallas Willard is a guy who passed away a couple of years ago, but a very uh, well-known Christian philosopher. Um, he said that joy biblically is not about pleasure, at least not in the moment, but is a pervasive sense of well-being. Hope in the godly, excuse me, hope in the goodness of God is joy's indispensable support. It's, again, about a joy that comes from a hope in who God is, a belief, a faith in who God is. Joy, again, is this attitude and attribute of God. So, joy is part of our spiritual DNA as new creatures. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, as Galatians said. But, as with all abilities that are given to us, whether as a fruit of the Spirit or an innate talent that were given by birth... <sighs> The abilities are things that we've got to choose to develop. I mean, think about it. If you've got a, a musical ability, you're a, a, a musical prodigy, and that's identified at three, do you think you can just stare at the piano for a couple of years and then show up in Carnegie Hall and it's going to all work out so well? I mean, even the prodigies have to work at it a bit. Sports, same thing. I mean, you've got some feet, people that are, are built for certain sports. You're seven foot four. You still got to develop the ability to play basketball. You've got arms that are eight inches longer than mine. You know, you can go for paddling and you can take some gold medals in the world like Tom McKay does around here. I stood out there with him after the last service and said, stretch out your arm, Tom. He stretched out his and I stretched out mine and his stretched out like that much further than mine. Go, there you go. There you go. I could do as well as you if I had your stuff. But the, but the idea is, again, we have those abilities, but Tom started practicing and he does every day. And he's won like four gold medals at the Worlds. So the idea is... Well, the same thing happens with the, the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't just pop up in us. We've got to make the choice to develop. We've got to make the choice to see those things happen. So choices are involved in developing joy. Real quickly, somebody's probably going to say, wait a minute, you're, you're mixing things up here. Music, sports, but, but the fruit of the Spirit, the feeling of joy. I mean, you can't just choose to make yourself feel joyful, can you? And, and I'd agree that's a problem. You can't just choose in the moment to be happy. 
Not always. But what you can do, you can recognize that there are choices that we can make that determine how we feel. There are choices that we make in terms of what we do, what we look at, what we read, how we let our mind wander that will determine how we feel. What are some of those choices? Well, let's look at three or four real quickly here. Number one, not surprisingly, get Jesus to get joy. You've got to have Jesus to get joy. You've got to receive Jesus Christ as Savior to get joy because that's the start of becoming a new creature in Christ with the DNA of God, with the the fruit of the Holy Spirit in place. As we get Jesus, it puts us in a place of security and, and enables a foundational aspect of joy that we really need to have, and we see it at Luke chapter 10, verse 20. This is where context here. Jesus has his disciples that he's given the ability to go out and do the stuff he was doing. They've gone out and they started healing the sick, casting demons out, moving in signs and wonders in the supernatural. And they come back pumped. I mean, they come back just all excited about it. And Jesus says, nevertheless, it's all good, but don't rejoice in this. Now, okay, let's qualify this. I don't think Jesus is saying, don't get happy when you see somebody healed. I don't think he's saying, don't get joyful when you see a demon cast out. He's saying, don't let that be the focal point, though. Don't let that be the main thing in terms of the joy, in terms of the happiness that you have. But rather, instead of being happy and rejoicing that the spirits are subject to you, rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Jesus goes all the way to the big prize. He goes all the way to the end. He said, the most important thing is that eternity, that your name, Judgment Day, your name's recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's the nexus of joy. That's the nexus that we look to, the connection point that we look to, as we consider joy in the fullest sense. It's what helps us get past some of the present circumstances that we walk in. So, again, choosing Jesus as God releases faith in your heart, as God opens your eyes choosing to grab hold of the Jesus that he shows you through scripture and the reality of what he accomplished on the cross is the first step. The second choice is then from there, choosing to monitor what we focus on, choosing to maintain the right focus. Because as we've said so many times before, focus determines your perspective and your perspective determines your reality. The idea is what you focus on, what you choose to focus on, develops a perspective on how you think, and that affects the reality that you live in. I mean, you can divide up, I could divide people up into two groups. How many of you watch CNN primarily? How many of you watch Fox News primarily? And what happens is you tell me and you talk to each other about which one you watch primarily, that has developed your perspective. And that perspective has created for you a particular reality that you walk in. I mean, it's not a condemnation, it's just a statement of how things work. You're going to have your reality shaped by what you listen to. You're going to have your reality shaped by where your focus is. And that has an effect on joy. (laughs) What we see here is have our focus on truth. Where we know truth is unalterable and, and it helps us get past the circumstances that presently aren't so joyful that we're in. Let's take a look at how Jesus did it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Jesus knew he was coming to die on a cross. But was he happy to be on the cross? I mean, it doesn't sound like it. I mean, from the the preamble we have to his entry onto the cross, where (laughs) where he's praying in a way where blood comes out. It it, it goes on, and and we see the, the situation as it unfolds. And it, it says that he experiences shame because he's, he's nailed naked to a cross. Hebrews 12 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the model for faith for us. He's the author and perfecter of faith who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. He wasn't happy about the shame he had to go through. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What, what did he do? How do you unpack that? 
Jesus went to the cross. He knew why he was on the cross. He didn't enjoy the cross, but he was looking ahead to the joy that was on the other side of the cross, on the other side of the resurrection. He was looking ahead to the joy and knowing what he was going to accomplish on the cross and the eventual matter of, of sitting next to the Father on, on the throne. It's, it's a matter of, of showing a picture of joy as distinguished from pleasure. <laughs> pleasure does not equal joy and often runs counter to developing joy. The cross wasn't pleasure to Jesus, but he was looking past the cross to the joy that was in front of him. It, it, it gets complicated for us sometimes. Paul, laying out this really complicated statement, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, where he talks about these dichotomies as saying, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As being sorrowful, as being full of grief and always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. It's the idea that you can have grief and sorrow in the moment and still be full of joy. Now, how do I know that? Because God is. Does God grieve? Yes, God grieves. It says in the Bible, God grieves over things. And at the same time, he's full of joy. Well, what do we do with that? Well, we understand the reality that that's the way life is going to be. We're going to have instances where there's shame, where there's grief. And at the same time, it's going to be a situation where, where there's supposed to be a pervasive, overshadowing joy that comes at the same time. All this leads to the question, in light of Hebrews 12 too, what have you set before you? Jesus set before himself the joy that he knew was on the other side of the cross, sitting down at the right hand of the Father, the accomplishment of the cross. What's the joy that's set before you? It's an important question because that's what your joy is connected to, what you set before yourself. If you set before yourself the, 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 the um, stock market ticker every day, looking at how your 401k is performing and trying then to figure out in eight years, this is how much is going to be there and my mandatory minimum withdrawals combined with my social security is going to give me X dollars you know, each month for the next umpteen years. I mean, that's not bad to plan, but if that's, where, if that's where your joy comes in as you watch the money accumulate, then, then you're screwed up. I mean, you're going to be so screwed, in fact, when you find out that you're going to die before you ever get to the point of making those mandatory minimum withdrawals. I mean, the, the idea is that, that truly what we're looking at is the idea that it's got to be the right connection of joy as we, we look ahead, that, that joy is a point of view, that it's a way of, of looking at things, and Jesus, again, gives us the example of not finding joy in the event, not finding joy in, in being proven right, but finding joy in the guaranteed outcome of what his purpose was on the cross. And then the, the third thing that's kind of included in the others is that joy is connected to faith. What you believe about what's in front of you is what matters. The big idea is joy is a focus of our faith before it becomes a feeling. Joy has got to be a focus of our faith before it becomes a feeling. What you and I feel is not usually a good indicator of what really is. Feelings, emotions, act out of our belief systems. They shouldn't form our belief systems. Our emotions don't have minds. Our feelings don't have minds. They can't think for themselves. We've got to think for our feelings and tell our feelings how to feel. I mean, sounds kind of weird, but, but it's true. Our thinking determines our feelings. You go, well, uh, it's not really. I mean, I'm feeling pretty bad, and I wasn't thinking about anything. Well, maybe that's the problem. I mean, you think about the right things, and that determines the way the feelings are going to go, and then the actions flow from there. It's something that, that you've got a choice in the bottom line. The bottom line is your joy is your job. Now, we serve a sovereign God who moves in providential ways. And at the same time, we're prohibited from being complacent. Faith is a matter of action that we take on what we believe. Faith is not just having some random idea in our minds what we believe. It's taking action on that. Uh, Christian, because uh, he's uh, our high school minister director, um, preached last night, 5 o'clock service, on, on uh, complacency. And, I mean, it, it shook me, it rocked me, because he's, he's challenging in a way that I needed to be challenged with the idea that, that you can't stay complacent in what God wants for your life. I mean, he used some great examples. He said, you know, when I was um, 
uh, looking to marry my wife Jody, uh, I, I prayed about it. I prayed about it and prayed about it, and God didn't answer me. He didn't say no, so I married her. He said, when I, when I was getting ready to start my business, same thing. I prayed and prayed and prayed. God didn't give me a yes, so I started the business. He said, what was that all about? He said, we live basically, he didn't say this exactly this way, but he said, basically, Christians, we need to understand we live in the green light district. Everything's a go with God. He'll stop us when he wants to stop us. He'll say, no, don't go there when we're not supposed to go there. But we can develop this idea of a super spiritualized complacency that puts us in a place where we're waiting for most of our lives for God to give us the go-ahead when all he's saying is, do something, do something. And, and it moves us into, oftentimes, the position God wants us to be in, where we've got to take some risks. Again, not against Scripture, not against the clear check from God that can often come in, but not trying to wait for that, that absolute yes that, that actually, in a strange way, can deplete faith. And we've got to be in this place where we're willing to, willing to go. So that's what it means, I think, when we're talking about your joy being your job, choosing faith in God's promises, understanding that you will become what you believe. That's from Romans chapter 4, right? Abraham, I mean, that's what it says there, basically. Abraham believed the promises of God. He looked beyond the circumstances and what they looked like, and by believing in the promises of God, placing his hope, his faith in those, he became what he believed, that is, the father, the father of, of many nations. So, what do I need to believe? What do you need to believe? Maybe you need to simply believe that joy doesn't come from present circumstances. Let go of the lie that if I'm going to be happy, my circumstances have to be happy circumstances. Maybe you need to let go of the lie that people can steal your joy, because truly they can't. You can give people your joy, but you can't you can't really lose it by somebody taking it from you. Or that, that while the capability for joy comes from God, your joy is something that, that you're responsible for. You, you need to believe that. I need to believe that. So what are the big problems, though, in blocking joy? There are some kill joys out there. There are some killers of joy, some joy blockers that, that I think we ought to look at before we leave today because Advent is a time where we do recalibrate our hearts. We recalibrate our hearts with, with hope. We recalibrate our hearts for peace and we need to recalibrate our hearts for what joy is all about and sometimes that means identifying some joy blockers that have come in. This is not a, an all-encompassing list. There's only three or four things I'm going to look at but they're big ones. Number one on the list is self-pity. You're never going to have joy if you're feeling sorry for yourself. I mean, self-pity is where we let our mood become our master. It's where we, we get all churned up inside, usually by what we think other people think, by being not valued highly enough, by being not appreciated as we think we should be appreciated. I mean, the list goes on and on with that, but self-pity is something that's going to keep us in that place of, of being the Aunt Polly in the world. It's going to keep us grumpy, it's going to keep us unhappy, and it's going to block joy from coming in. Number two, jealousy. Jealousy is a huge enemy of, of joy. I mean, <clears throat> think about it this way, parable of the talents. Matthew chapter 25, you know, there's a guy that a master goes away, he leaves one um, of his servants five talents, piece of money, uh, one two talents, and one one talent. You know, the one talent guy was the bad guy. Master comes back, he didn't invest it, he buried it, because he said he's afraid he's going to lose it, and the master calls him an evil, wicked, lazy guy. The first two guys, the five talent and two talent guy, they both, you know, come back and they bring a return to the master, and the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, good enough, but have you ever thought about the, the two-talent guy? You know, the two-talent guy sees the master give the guy five talents. Do you think maybe he was thinking, why did he get five talents and I only got two talents? And did that put him in a place of, of then being reluctant to do anything with the two talents because he's so caught up in the jealousy of the guy with the five talents that he doesn't do what he has with what he's got, been given? I mean, this is what can happen with jealousy it can get us in a place where, where we're frozen. Now, the two-talent guy didn't do that. He didn't fall into that, that, that pit of, 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 of jealousy. The point, though, is, is that it's something to watch out for. James 3.16 says it this way. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. 
a close cousin and often a precursor to jealousy is comparison. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt said one time that comparison is the primary thief of joy. Comparison is the primary thief of joy. And you can imagine how that works. I mean, some of us are, are scrolling away our joy every day as we, we look through the social media feeds. And we're, again, looking at uh, somebody else has gone on vacation, somebody else has done this, somebody else has done that. And again, we don't remember the, the, the common statement, that's the, the stage presence you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, they went on vacation, but they'll be in debt with their credit card for the next 10 years. I mean, the, the idea is that comparison culture, the one we live in, a comparison culture, can, can eat us alive because we do compare our real life to others' highlight reels, and that's always a, a losing proposition. We get in trouble with it. Um, random parable to close up with here is um, the parable of the fig tree that Jesus told at Luke chapter 13, verses 6 to 9. And this is connected with what we're looking at. Jesus began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit, figs, I imagine, and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next, fine. And if it doesn't, cut it down. What's going on? Well, the moral of the story, I think, is very simple. The guy who planted the fig tree intended to pick from what he planted. He planted a fig tree. He intended to pick figs from the fig tree. So what's the point? How does that connect with us with comparison to jealousy? The point is that some of you are fig trees and you're not bearing figs because you want to bear apples. And you're working real hard at bearing apples and you're never going to bear apples because you're a fig tree. And we're supposed to be focused on bearing what God has put us in a place to bear and you're going to be discouraged and the joy is going to be blocked completely because you keep trying to grow what God hasn't planted. This is about spiritual gifts. This is about callings. This is about what God has on your life. It's about knowing what, what your purpose is. It's about getting to the point where you can stop apologizing for what you're not good at, not talking about character, talking about gifts and callings. Stop apologizing for what you're not good at and focus your attention on what you are good at. It's getting past the comparison. It's getting past the trying to be what somebody else is and be who you are. For me, for years, I used to, whenever you know, my car, my truck would act up, I'd go out, I'd pop the hood, I'd examine what was going on. And the truth is, I had no clue what was going on because I'm not mechanically inclined at all. I, I finally came to a point a few years ago where I don't open the hood of my truck anymore. If something goes wrong, I take it to a Coos Automotive, and they, they take care of it. And, and that, that released greater joy. As I, I quit trying to act like I, I knew what was happening in an area where I knew nothing at all. And, and maybe you've got the same kind of hang-ups that, that work in your life. It's like quit trying to bear apples if you're a fig tree. You know, I think if I'm a fig tree, I'm going to bear some figs and do pretty well at it. But I'm not going to be any good at bearing apples. And the same thing is true with you. It's, it's why they don't let me up here on the stage during worship to sing. They don't even let me turn my microphone on in the audience to sing. I mean, I've got no ability in that area, and so they want me to shut up, and I, I understand that, and I will. But, but the idea for, for all of us is that, that we, we're going to be blocking our joy as we try to be something that, that, that we're not. The choices we have is involve a choice of, of how we view, again, what it means to enjoy God and in doing so glorify him and, and what it means to be a carrier of, of that joy. As you enter a room, any room, over the next you know, few weeks of the Christmas holidays and after, you're going to enter a room and you're going to either be a thermometer or a thermostat. The idea is you're going to come into a room 
and you're either going to adjust yourself to the temperature of that room. Let's say you walk into a room and you're in the room with a bunch of Republicans, you're going to adjust to that, that level. You're walking into a room, you're, you're in the room with a bunch of Democrats, you're going to adjust to that level or, or run out of the room. And, and in the process of it, what happens? Well, in the process of it, usually complaint, chaos, anything but joy starts coming into play. Or you walk into a room and you determine that you're going to be the thermostat in the room because that's the call that you and I have, to be thermostats in, in this culture. And, and what does that mean? It means that a thermostat sets the, sets the atmosphere of the room. We set the atmosphere. We lower it, we raise it by bringing in the, the truth and reality of, of life and of what, what, joy, what joy means. It means that that we recognize that we're going to be contagious. This week, you're going to be contagious. I'm going to be contagious. You're going to be contagious like Aunt Polly, or you're going to be contagious like Pollyanna. You're going to serve the chief end of why you were created, by enjoying God, by glorifying him, or by glorifying him through enjoying him, or are you going to serve some other purpose that, that God didn't create you to fulfill in the first place? And ultimately, that's not going to lead to joy you're not going to be happy. See, all this gets back around to the idea that God wants you and me holy and happy. Not a happiness that's pleasure-focused, but a happiness that's looking at the bigger picture and ultimately at, at that eternity that's to come that's flavored by what happens in the moments we're living now. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love, your goodness, your grace. I ask that you'd sort through the jumble of words and you, Holy Spirit, would give life to your word as you, you enable us to understand what it means for joy to have entered this world, to understand what it means for you, Emmanuel, to reside in us. Help us, Father, to be able to walk out this Christmas season in a way that, that truly does enjoy you and in the process, that we have a, a contagious joy that, that creates an atmosphere where people want to know what's the root of it, where it opens opportunities for the gospel. All this, Father, we ask in the power of Jesus Christ's name. Amen.